To the best of our knowledge, no one has previously linked vitamin D studies with red light therapy, also known as photobiomodulation, so this might be the first. But due to the complex nature of this topic, there are many moving parts in this video. But we've tried to simplify and streamline the information as much as possible. However, as with all scientific topics, one needs to see the full picture before jumping to conclusions. So if you want to experience that aha moment we all love to have when we learn something new, be sure to watch the whole video. All right, let's begin. Vitamin D has been well researched and over the years it's become well known just how important this nutrient is for our health and well-being. However, let's quickly summarize the benefits. Vitamin D is actually considered to be a hormone. In the past, it was primarily thought to be used by the body in conjunction with calcium to build bone matter. That's why vitamin D first made headlines during a rickets outbreak in the early 1900s. Rickets is a nasty disorder that weakens and softens bones, stunts growth, and in severe cases causes skeletal deformities. Anyway, it got so bad that food producers started fortifying milk, orange juice, and many other foods with vitamin D to fight the epidemic. Even some beer and soap was enriched with vitamin D. The research has evolved since then, and we now know that vitamin D can help to prevent a plethora of autoimmune diseases cancers, and skin disorders. A vitamin D deficiency is linked to depression, osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease, sleep disorders, obesity, diabetes, Alzheimer's, and much more. Nowadays, even though rickets is no longer a widespread issue, it is still estimated that more than 50% of the world's population is vitamin D deficient, and possibly a larger percentage have less than optimal amounts in their bodies at any given time. This makes vitamin D deficiency one of the most common medical conditions in the world. So how did we get to this point and how can red light therapy help us to beef up our vitamin D count? Well, we need to first understand that there are only three sources of vitamin D. The first is from food, which is the least optimal source. Unless we are regularly eating mountains of fatty fish, especially fish liver, it's actually pretty difficult to get our recommended daily requirements of vitamin D from food. To put things into perspective, let's look at a table from the United States National Health Institute. Besides cod liver oil, one would need to eat either half a kilogram of salmon, or 13 cans of tuna, or 48 eggs, or 17 glasses of fortified milk to get the recommended daily amount of vitamin D from food alone. And because most of the foods containing the highest amounts of vitamin D are animal-based, vegans are likely to be a particularly high-risk population. Obviously, dietary supplementation of vitamin D, which is our second source, can help to increase vitamin D levels, and most multivitamin manufacturers do add vitamin D3 to their mixtures nowadays. However, one needs to know what quantities would be sufficient to raise your vitamin D levels above the recommended minimum of 30 to 50 nanograms per milliliter. For example, a study done in Boston found that 1,000 international units, abbreviated IUs, supplemented daily was not enough to raise their participants' levels of vitamin D above the minimum threshold during the winter months. So would 2,000 IUs have been enough or even 3,000? It's difficult to say without frequent testing. The reason for this inconsistency is that only about 60% of vitamin D makes it through the digestive system and into the liver for processing. Furthermore, those with digestive issues might absorb less vitamin D through their intestines than their healthier counterparts, which exacerbates the issue. It is said that those who have had a gastric bypass might need to take up to 50,000 IUs of daily supplemental vitamin D to maintain adequate body concentrations. To add even more nuance to this point, Many supplemental formulas of vitamin D and fortified foods contain the D2 variant of the vitamin, which is less active in the body, so it is an inferior form than its D3 counterpart. So if food is a poor source of vitamin D and it is tough to know what dose of the supplement to take, as well as to quantify their impact, then is there a better way of attaining this essential nutrient? Luckily there is, and this brings us to our final source of vitamin D, which is sunlight. Our bodies can actually make vitamin D via the sunlight by means of a chemical reaction that occurs when UV rays enter the top layer of the skin, which is called the epidermis. Sun exposure is so efficient at producing vitamin D via the skin that in the right circumstances, 10 to 25 times more vitamin D can be produced during one exposure than by digesting the highest vitamin D containing foods. Vitamin D derived from UV light also circulates in the body two to three days longer than dietary sources. One also never needs to worry about overdosing and intoxicating the body with this vitamin because when our bodies sense that we have received enough UV rays, 
The skin converts the excess vitamin D into compounds such as lumisterol and toxisterol. And it just so happens that these lumisterol and toxisterol byproducts are anti-cancerous for the skin, which further benefits us. However, science wouldn't be science if there weren't some exceptions to the rule. So when it comes to getting enough vitamin D from the sun, there are a few other factors at play. One of them is the zenith angle, which is basically the angle at which the sun rays hits our body. So early in the morning and late afternoon, the sun rays travel a longer distance through the atmosphere to reach our skin compared to the period around noon. This extra distance enables the atmosphere to absorb more UV light, which negatively affects vitamin D production. So effectively, there is a window only between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. when you can maximally utilize UV rays for vitamin D production. These issues are further exacerbated during the winter months from those living far north or south of the equator. Furthermore, because vitamin D is made in the epidermis, the thickness of that layer is another factor that determines how quickly our bodies can produce vitamin D from UV light. It is for this reason that elderly people are more susceptible to vitamin D deficiency because our skin thins out with age. All this being said, sun exposure at the right time of day and season trumps any other method of obtaining vitamin D. Additionally, regular sun exposure also helps to calibrate our internal day-night clock, known as our circadian rhythms, which is essential for a good night's sleep. But I know what you might be asking. It's all well and good that the sun can give us the most bang for our buck when it comes to vitamin D production and other health markers. But isn't UV light emitted by the sun dangerous? Doesn't it increase our risk of skin cancer, damage our skin and cause wrinkles? Well, you would be correct, but as with all health science topics, there's always a lot of nuance to the story. So let's investigate so we can tie the research on red light therapy into all of this. The working class in most of the Western world spends more than 90% of their time indoors and therefore out of the sun, which is the main reason for the alarming rates of vitamin D deficiency. When we do go outside, it's oftentimes with sunscreen on because we've developed this fear of the sun causing wrinkles and possibly lethal skin conditions. So even the little bit of sun we do see can't benefit us from a vitamin D perspective. Furthermore, our skin has become so maladapted to the sun that when we do decide to spend a lot of time outdoors on odd occasions, our skin is unprepared and we burn. This is key. It is sunburn that damages our skin, but not sun exposure in and of itself. Therefore, it's the duration of exposure and your preparedness for exposure at that time that matters most. With that in mind, we can finally bring red light therapy into the picture. Red and near infrared are light frequencies between ranges of 630 to 940 nanometers. The spectrum of red and invisible light is not only emitted by these devices here on the table, but are most abundantly found outdoors at sunrise and sunset, which is why the sky looks so red at those times. This everyday natural occurrence is thought to help precondition our skin for the harsh UV rays found in high amounts around noon. To test this theory out, scientists isolated parts of the skin and shone various non-UV light frequencies on each individually isolated segment. The first area received no light, the second patch received blue light, the third orange, the fourth red, and the rest increasing frequencies of near-infrared light. 24 hours later, the same patch of skin was exposed to the sort of harsh UV light that is common at midday. This was the result. As you can see, the no light patch burned pretty badly and the area pre-exposed to blue light did not do much better. However, as you move on from red to near infrared, the burns became significantly less severe. These results demonstrate that sunrise times are important for preconditioning our skin for the midday sun. These photobiomodulation LED light devices that we have here bathe one in those same photoprotective wavelengths of light that one gets at sunrise and sunset. So they will prepare your skin for the harsh midday sun as shown in the study. Furthermore, red and infrared light has the ability to penetrate deep into the layers of the skin and actually stimulate the epidermis layer to thicken, as seen in the before and after pictures of this photobiomodulation study by Dr. Lee and colleagues. The increased epidermal thickness means that there are more cells available to chemically produce vitamin D during UV light exposure, making the whole process more efficient. So we now have a scenario whereby through the use of red light therapy, our body can receive their required daily dose of vitamin D more efficiently and with less overall sun exposure needed. 
plus the preconditioning effects of red light therapy can prevent burning and damaging of the skin during sun exposure. These benefits of red light therapy can be helpful to everyone, but especially to the elderly who have thinner and more frail skin, yet still require adequate levels of vitamin D from the sun. Okay, so let's recap. Vitamin D is essential for our health. The sun provides us with the best source of vitamin D, but unfortunately, in this day and age, we don't get enough of the UV rays that promote its production due to our modern day lifestyle. We need to spend a lot more time in the midday sun to acquire healthy levels of this essential nutrient. However, more UV sun exposure, especially when we are not used to it, would increase the risk of sun damage to our skins. So to combat this issue, red light therapy could be used. The photobiomodulatory effect of these spectrums of light would precondition and protect the skin from sunburn and also help the skin to recover from daily exposure. Additionally, the ability of red light therapy to thicken the epidermis of the skin would make vitamin D production more efficient with less UV exposure time needed. If however you don't own one of these devices or can't afford one, the general rule of thumb is that if you're outdoors and your shadow is taller than you are, then you are taking advantage of the therapeutic early morning and late afternoon red and near infrared sunlight. Wow, that was a lot of science, but I hope it was interesting to you. Let us know by liking this video. Over the next few episodes, we'll be delving more deeply into red light therapy research. You can expect content on how photobiomodulation positively impacts sleep, muscle recovery, joint health, our brains, and much more. In the meantime, if you want to learn more about these home devices and their benefits, you can follow the links below. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell for more health science made simple. But until next time, keep on exercising your health. Cheers.